Inclusive design is about putting people at the heart of the design process. It's about creating buildings and spaces, streets, public realm, parks, gardens, etc., that are really comfortable and easy for all of us to use. There are three key things in implementing inclusive design. Um, one is, in essence, social responsibility. Are we delivering a building that is what it should be and what we expect it to be? Um, the other is to reward those who do it right, um, so that that's an example to those who are less interested. And th thirdly is th the business of a designer enjoying seeing their building function in the way that it was actually intended to function, where people can get the very best from it. You might ask why there's a special door that I came through as opposed to the revolving door. And there's a good reason for that. The revolving doors move quite fast, actually, and it's not always easy for people who move slowly or with children in a wheelchair or in a buggy or in a wheelchair to get through them. So we have an alternative door here, um, and it's a standard. It's not a luxury, it's what we do, because those sorts of revolving doors are required for keeping the heat in the building. But they don't suit me and they don't suit many people. So we designed something else called a power operated door. It works on command. It's a standard, it's what we expect. Chiswick Park, which is where we are now, is, is actually quite an unusual concept in that it's a workplace, but it's more than a workplace. It's somewhere that's nice to be. And it offered interesting challenges here because there are a variety of levels this deck we're sitting on here, the water behind us, they're all on different levels. We had to be quite inventive about, is this gonna be slippery or safe when it's wet? What about somebody who's blind? How would they know where they are? Um, the acoustics of the area, it's quite noisy actually. Not sure what we do about that, but it's all part of developing standards in response to new challenges. And I think this is a new concept or relatively new and it throws up new challenges and we need standards to, to be able to design them properly. Inclusive design in anything, it could be a product or a building, is, is um, looking at how people use it. It's really about usability and what it's saying is that everybody who would use that product, use that building, the environment or the space should be able to do so. And there's a list of things that we try to achieve. Uh, they should be able to use it uh, conveniently, they should certainly be able to use it safely. Um, they should be able to also use it with dignity. Uh, but importantly, we try to ensure that wherever possible, people can use it independently. Our supermarkets, well before the Disability Discrimination Act, were engaged in what you might call good design. Forget about their appearance, their arguments about that. But you had parking by the entrance, you had level entrances, wide aisles, bright lighting, good signage, cafes, toilets, everything was there. Why? Because they want my money. If we get good inclusive design, we know it works for disabled people, but it will also work for older people, families with children. You know, you see lots of people wheeling trolleys around London now with computers and stuff in. So good access suits everybody. Inescapably, you must have standards to work to because in the end, you're using other people's money to build a building that may be there for a hundred years, why would you afford to get it wrong? Of course, standards are how you get it right. The British standard, BS 8300, like any other British standard, is, is a good practice guidance document. It's not the same as the minimum recommended or the minimum mandatory specification like the building regulations. What it does is it goes into all aspects of accessibility and gives um, indications of what is good practice rather than minimum standards. Good morning. Uh, can I actually see Sophie Sandal when we pass through? Yes. So it looks at things like access into buildings, um, the use of desks and other things. It also looks at um, uh, things related to the management of buildings, the different type of buildings. Accessibility can be designed, but it also has to be managed in practice. And what British Standards BSA 300 tries to do is link that design standard with a management standard. Um, so once we've actually provided it, we make sure that it's, it's, it's ongoing for the people who will use the building. Standards in the design process are indispensable. 
to it because um, any designer will have opinions, any professional will have opinions about what they do. And the end user of a building is somebody who's way downstream from the early design process. So how on earth do you make somebody involved in the initial design of a building produce something that's going to deliver what's required for the person who he or she has never even met and won't ever meet who's going to use that building? And actually it's standards that make that happen. We have had access standards in, in this country, in, in the UK, for, for, uh, for 40, almost 50 years now. But the, the standards have gradually improved. It very much was, at the very beginning, very much about ramps and toilets for disabled people and door widths and sizes of lifts, etc. And gradually, as we've learnt how to um, be more inclusive about our access standards, it's broadened out to um, a much more um, comprehensive standard. If a non-disabled person can go to a shop and buy a hamburger or go into a supermarket to buy goods or go to the Olympics or go swimming, then a disabled person should have an equal opportunity to do the same. People who run businesses or provide services now want to deliver a good standard. It is the benchmark. Disabled people are often quite demanding of what they might need and if you can deliver that, quite honestly, you're delivering a good standard to everybody.